morning. It's good to be with those of you here in person and online. I am Douglas Childress, for those of you visiting from uh, places other than the seminary, and I teach here at Baltic Methodist Theological Seminary. Today, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the class on Jeremiah. And uh, I will introduce for you our visiting professor today, Kelvin Friebel. Kelvin is a friend of mine from uh, the United States. However, he is uh, a citizen of Canada as well. And uh, uh, I met him, and Cooley also is his friend, uh, the rector of our seminary in upstate New York where he and Cooley taught for several years. Kelvin is an expert on the Old Testament. He got his degree at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, he uh, has taught at various institutions for many years and is currently basically retired. However, he's out of retirement yeah. today for you. And uh, just so you know, he also studied a year in uh, Israel, uh, though that was a few years after Jeremiah was there, uh, yes. but uh, he has walked the same ground. Uh, but uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Kelvin, who will be leading you today. Uh, if you would, uh, if you are at home, be sure to turn on your video camera. Uh, we want to be able to see you as well. So uh, get your camera on in the next few minutes uh, if you have to do your hair or whatever else. Uh, regardless, uh, if you have a question and you're online, just write it in the chat box and uh, Kelvin will answer that uh, when it's appropriate. Uh, as we begin, let, join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we have this time together today to look at the uh, ministry of Jeremiah, how he ministered prophetically, and uh, also related to our contemporary world. I pray for Kelvin as he teaches, and us as we listen, learn, and interact. Bless this time to your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks, Doug. Well, it's my privilege to be here uh, at the seminary again. I was here four years ago. Um, I taught a wisdom literature class, which I'm also doing while I'm here this time as well. Um, then two years ago, um, I did a video course on the Book of Lamentations. Did anybody do that video course on Lamentations? No, you are all spared that. Right. Um, so it's my privilege to be here, and uh, my wife is also along. Um, she's out doing gardening, I guess, at, <laughs> at their place today. Um, but it is my privilege to be here, and as we look at the book of Jeremiah, ministering prophetically to a contemporary world. In other words, even though we are not prophets, in the sense that Jeremiah was a prophet, God still calls each and every one of us as a follower to somehow minister prophetically or in the way that a prophet would function. Not that we are a prophet in the sense that we say, thus says the Lord, um, but we are called to minister to our contemporary world. And so we're going to look at the life and theology of Jeremiah to see how did he minister? What did he do in his role as a prophet in the midst of his contemporary world? And then try to make that kind of application into our various ministries, uh, whether official ministries or lay ministries, which we, we would have in the church today. Um, <clears throat> Just, just one kind of logistic thing. How many of you are taking the class for credit? If you just want to raise your hand if you're taking it for credit. One, two. Okay. 
Um, there we go. There should be. There were four signed up. Okay. Um, maybe rather than trying to go over the syllabus, maybe I can interact with just the four of you uh, separately to go over any questions or that that you have about the syllabus and or the assignments or anything else. Is that okay? Can we? We'll, well, for those who are doing it online, we'll set up and set up something to connect with with the two online as well to do that then, okay? Um, yeah, so we're meeting today and then next Tuesday evening and Wednesday evening as well, so. And now my, there we go. So kind of some background related to Jeremiah as a prophet before we actually get into um, the prophetic words which he spoke itself. Um, very, very briefly, uh, the Old Testament is divided into four main sections, Pentateuch or law, historical books, uh, poetry and wisdom, and then the major and the minor prophets. Obviously, Jeremiah in, is one of the major prophets. Um, Lamentations and Ezekiel are highlighted because they're, um, they're not prophetic books like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And I don't want to go into a whole discussion, but Daniel is never called a prophet in the Old Testament, even though he talks about future events. Um, he is not, he's not really a prophet in the biblical Old Testament sense of a prophet. Um, so major prophets, you have Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and obviously we're dealing with, with Jeremiah. It's interesting when you take both the major prophets and minor prophets, they all tend to be grouped around four key events in the life of God's people of Israel or Judah. Uh, one is the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel in 721. Um, so you have a, a whole group of prophets, um, Isaiah, Hosea, Amos, Jonah is there, Micah. All of these are ministering to, the nor to the, God's people when this catastrophic event of the fall of the northern kingdom is about to take place. Another one, then, is the grouping around 586 B.C., the fall of the southern kingdom of Judah. Um, and here you have Jeremiah, contemporary Ezekiel, who's off in exile at that point, but still a contemporary, um, Obadiah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. The latter three are a little bit earlier than Jeremiah, but nevertheless, they too are speaking toward this specific historical event that is about to happen to God's people that the Babylonians are going to come in and destroy the city of Jerusalem. The third grouping is around the, once they have returned from exile, God tells them to rebuild the temple and so 520 BC is the rebuilding of the temple and you can see you have Joel and very specifically Haggai and Zechariah at that. And then the other incident where you have essentially only one, but Malachi um, much later. But it's these historical events, it seems like as God is about to do something or as God is doing something in the context of history, with his people, God brings prophets to speak God's word to them. And as we'll talk about with Jeremiah, so that God's people understand what God is doing in that historical context. Um, <clears throat> wouldn't it be great if we had prophets today that actually came in and said, uh, <clears throat> You know, this is what God is doing in the midst of this situation. And I'm not trying to be political here, but wouldn't it be great if God, God spoke his word and said, this is what I'm doing with respect to the war in Ukraine. So that there would be no question as to how we are, as believers are to respond to that situation. Um, 
or other world events. Uh, and that's specifically what God did. He called the prophets in the midst of those key historical events um, to speak and interpret to the people what God was doing. <clears throat> Another way in which the prophets have frequently been <clears throat> categorized is based upon the world power, which was the dominant world power at that time. <clears throat> so the Syrian empire and it is the Assyrians who come in and destroy the northern kingdom of Israel in 721 BC. Um, the Babylonian Empire, which is where we're dealing with Jeremiah, and subsequent to that, the <clears throat> Babylonian Empire was uh, taken over by the Persians. Um, and so sometimes you'll, in books about the prophets, you'll see that they're categorized more based on this historical evaluation. Um, yeah, I might just say all of this, all these PowerPoints are online, okay? Um, you can download those PowerPoints, or if you want to bring your computer in, uh, the PowerPoints are there, and they are there in Estonian and Russian as well, okay? Um, so if you don't, if you, if you speak Estonian and Russian, it's probably very helpful to get those PowerPoints um, that are translated there, okay? <clears throat> Before we talk about Jeremiah as a prophet, a key question is, what is Old Testament prophecy? How do we define what prophecy is in the Old Testament? As, as we talk about Jeremiah, when we say this is prophecy that he gave, what do we mean by that term prophecy? Okay. Uh, a frequent perspective related to biblical prophecy is that the Old Testament prophets were predicting events at the end of times. So that <clears throat> Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the other minor prophets, they're sitting there talking about basically contemporary events for us because they're prophesying that which will take place at the end times. Um, so, you know, China and the end time prophecy, Iraq, Babylon of the end times. Uh, how does modern day Israel fulfill Old Testament prophecy? But the perspective basically is that the prophets were sitting there talking about events which are contemporary for us. Um, yeah, okay. But I think there's some inaccurate assumptions in that type of perspective of the Old Testament. Uh, one is it assumes that all prophecy is prediction. In other words, when we define the term prophecy, we mean foretelling the future, predicting the future. And so every prophetic word, based on kind of this interpretation, every prophetic word is foretelling something that is going to happen in the future, okay? Then a significant part of the Old Testament prophecy, as it foretells the future, deals with the end times, okay? When Christ will come back again, the very end of the age, okay? And then the other assumption is, since we are living in the end times, Old Testament prophecy is predicting contemporary events. And so this kind of perspective oftentimes is really sitting there with the Old Testament pro prophecy in one hand, and a little bit dated, but a newspaper, which we don't have newspapers anymore, but a contemporary news broadcast on the other hand, and seeing how they correlate with one another. In other words, what's happening in our world today, did the prophets have something to say about that? Because we, oh, they were talking about the end times, so they must have been predicting the contemporary events uh, which are taking place. Um, but there's a difficulty with, with those kind of assumptions, okay? 
Um, if, if I would ask you the question, um, if you take all of the Old Testament prophecies, and I know you're, probably, you're just guessing at this point, but how much of the Old Testament prophecies actually do predict future events? So do you, can you get a mental percentage or a percentage in your mind? What do you think that um, of all of the prophecy in the Old Testament, how much of it is foretelling future events? Okay. You got that in your mind? Okay. How many of you would say over 75% prophecy in the Old Testament is predicting future events? Okay. Over 50%. Okay. Uh, over 10%. <laughs> a few. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, all right. Now, of that, of those predictions related to the future, what percentage do you think deal with end time events? Okay. 5%? Okay. Any other suggestions? 1%. 1 percent. 10. 10? Okay. Zero to 1%. Okay, um, yeah, because if we if we start looking at that, oh, there it is. There's a question I was asking. What pre, how much, what predict what is the prediction of the future and what are the prediction of the end times? I will come back to that. Okay. Um, as we look at Old Testament prophecy and define what it is. There are really two main categories of Old Testament prophecy. The first is that of foretelling. Foretelling prophecy is, it's future oriented and so it is prediction. So the prophecy is saying what will happen in the future, okay? But there's another kind of prophecy which is that of forthtelling which is very present oriented and the messages are primarily applicable to the contemporary time of the prophet. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me clarify these a little bit. Uh, foretelling prophecy, again, future oriented. It is prediction. And within the prophetic books, it is the prophet declaring God's plans and intentions with respect to the future. Now, with respect to the future from the point that the prophet is saying it. So future can be 10 years down the road, two years down the road, or 100 years down the road, okay? Um, and those, yeah, foretelling prophecy really kind of deals with two issues that the prophets focus on that that God is going to bring judgment. So it talks about coming judgment or the other main category is that God is going to restore his people after the judgment has occurred. Um, so that's foretelling prophecy. Again, foretelling prophecy as being present oriented. Um, it really becomes God's critique of the current situation and God speaking that critique through the prophet. Um, sometimes the prophetic word is, thus says the Lord, it's simply advice as to what, in some cases, the king or the people should do in the present circumstances or situation. Uh, we're gonna run across that in Jeremiah chapter 18, uh, where Jeremiah ends up wearing a yoke because the king at that time is trying to decide whether to rebel against Babylon. And the whole point of wearing the yoke is, this is God's word of saying, submit to the yoke of Babylon. It's not a judgment. 
it's simply giving advice to the king and to the nation of how they should relate to Babylon at that particular point in time. Um, oftentimes, and we'll find this extensively in Jeremiah, the prophetic word is indicting or accusing the people of sins. Um, prophet comes along and says, this is what God says you are doing wrong in your relationship with God. There's nothing future about that. It's simply contemporary application to the audience. Oftentimes in association with that, and we'll see this in Jeremiah, then calls the people to repent. Okay? This is what you're doing wrong. Turn back to God. Seek God's forgiveness in your relationship. Restore the relationship with God. There's nothing future-oriented about this. This is just talking to the situation the audience is in. Um, sometimes there's exhortations to live out the covenant obligations. Sometimes the prophets simply say, you're doing a good job. You're living faithfully with God. Continue to live that out that sense of faithfulness to him. Okay. And as you can see, you know, none of these are future oriented. They are not predictions. In fact, the forth telling prophecy is very much like preaching. It's like what a preacher does on Sunday morning or any, yeah. Um, it's simply talking directly to the circumstances of the people, applying God's word into that situation. Again, the difference between a prophet and a contemporary preacher is the prophet is receiving it directly from God and voicing it to the people, whereas the modern day preacher is going to God's past revelation in his word and then seeking to make the contemporary application to the audience to which he, is, he or she is preaching. Okay? Um, so, does that... That makes sense. Okay, these two main categories of prophecy. Okay, um, going back to my question. How much of Old Testament prophecy then is foretelling and how much of it is forthtelling? Um, these are statistics which have been done uh, by uh, Stuart and Fee in the book entitled How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. Um, so I'm not taking credit for this, and I've not gone through and calculated it myself. I'm assuming they've done a good job in calculating this. But their calculation is only about 25% of prophecy is foretelling prediction. And again, that is prediction from the point of the prophet, okay? Anything which will happen in the future from the, the time the prophet says it. Okay, seventy-five percent of prophecy is actually forth-telling, speaking God's word to the and application to the contemporary audience. Which means this perspective of sitting there with the Old Testament prophetic book in one hand and listening to the news broadcasts on the other doesn't oftentimes take into consideration this aspect. Now, does it mean that the forth telling prophecy was only applicable to the, the audience of the prophet? No, absolutely not. And as we go through Jeremiah, we will look at the theology. In other words, as he points out the people's sins, how do we then apply that into our contemporary situation in ministry? When God calls them to repent, how do we apply that into our contemporary situation? Because the theology of the prophetic word is applicable in various generations and various contexts, okay? Um, so this is how we should approach it. Then the other question, how much of it deals with yet to come end times events? Okay. And again, this is from Fee and Stewart's book. 
their breakdown of predictive prediction in the Old Testament, they say 2% is the predicting of the coming of the Messiah, which has been fulfilled in Jesus, okay? 5% deal with the establishing of a new covenant, which again, from our perspective, has already been fulfilled uh, through the, the ministry, life, and death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, okay? He established the new covenant. Um, they're saying 17% of prediction deal with imminent historical events. For example, Jeremiah predicts that Babylon is going to destroy the city of Jerusalem. It takes place just a few years after he starts giving that prophetic word. Um, Isaiah talks about the coming in of the Assyrians, the invasion of the Assyrians. That happened in the lifetime of Isaiah. Um, yeah, so 17% are imminent historical events, which means only 1%, <clears throat> is that what you chose, Doug? 1%. <laughs> That's because you, you looked at my notes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but only 1% deal with end times events. Which means, again, that, that whole perspective of reading prophecy to see how it relates to the end times is really kind of misreading the intent and the purpose and function of the majority of prophecy. And by focusing only on these, we overlook the majority of what the prophets were actually saying um, and miss the contemporary application of, of their messages. Okay. Um, yeah. Which means then, how should we properly read and interpret Old Testament prophecy? I already mentioned this, that we, with respect to the message content, Old Testament prophecy is theological in nature. That is, it's trying to inform the people of who God is, and if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then that God that they are talking about is the same God, and so we can understand what they were telling the people God was back then, we can use it to help us, ourselves, understand who is God, and how does God work in the world? And the reciprocal response, of what God's people should be doing in light of what God is doing. In other words, the prophets gave their messages primarily to communicate to the people something about God and about how God works in the world. That's the primary purpose of Old Testament prophecy. Um, The function of Old Testament prophecy, in other words, with respect to what it's trying to accomplish, is it is designed to persuade. In other words, Old Testament prophecy was trying to produce a change in the audience, whether that be a change in their thinking, whether it be a change in their doing, their actions. Um, Oftentimes, I think we think of prophecy as simply communicating information, information of what would happen. But no, it is primarily given to persuade the people. Um, let me just illustrate, yeah. Yeah, I'll illustrate that in just a minute. With foretelling prophecy, this, this rhetorical or persuasive intent is, is very clear, okay? If you're giving advice, well, prophet gives a divine advice. What is the expectation? That the people will do what God has told them to do. If the prophet is indicting or accusing the people of their sins, its intent is not that the people sit there, oh yeah, we're doing that, we're doing this, we're doing that. You're right. Now the intent of it is that they acknowledge their sin 
and then a call to repent, what is its design and purpose? It is to get the people to repent of their sins. Okay? Um, if the prophet is exhorting the people to live according to the covenant, then the expected response to that prophetic message is that the people will renew their commitment to live according to the covenant. In other words, a forthtelling prophecy, which is non-predictive, present-oriented, um, that it is persuasive in intent seems to be fairly, fairly obvious, right? Okay. The difficulty, yeah, becomes, it's obvious with that, but what about prediction? How is foretelling prophecy persuasive in its intent? Isn't God just saying, this is going to be what happens, and then it happens? Isn't that the purpose of, of foretelling? Well, um, I would suggest to you that as God talks about judgment and restoration, it too is designed to elicit a response of turning and trusting God rather than simply just a fatalistic submission to the inevitable. In other words, God said it, it's going to happen. There's nothing we can do about it because God said it was going to happen. Okay? That's a fatalistic submission to the predicted prophecy. But if you look at um, prediction, there we go. From the book of Jonah, God gives to Jonah the message to the city of Nineveh, okay? And what is the message? And this is a prediction. It is a foretelling of what will happen. God says, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's predicting a future event, okay? But what was the purpose? Why did God give that message through Jonah to the city of Nineveh? Was it to merely give them the information that Nineveh was going to be overthrown in 40 days? In other words, was the whole purpose that they, you know, Jonah gives a prophecy and on their calendar, they mark out, okay, uh, that, and they start counting you know, okay, 40 days from now, that's down here, that's going to happen, okay. And so every day we just tick off another one of the days as we're getting closer to it. Was that the purpose of the prediction? No, we find in Jonah, after the prophecy was given in 3, 5 and following, the people of Nineveh believed in God, they proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the smallest of them. And it's also included here that they put sackcloth on their animals as well. You know, so if you had a pet dog or something, you made them wear sackcloth during this time. And the king gives out this decree, let them turn each one from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. In other words, the prophecy, the predictions given 40 days from now, Nineveh is going to be overthrown. But they didn't sit back and just fatally submit and say, okay, there's nothing we can do. 40 days from now, we're going to be wiped out. No, they responded by turning back to God. Okay. And they do so, and this is their attitude toward that. Who knows? God may turn and may relent, or God may change his mind and turn from his fierce anger, and we will not perish. They understood predictive prophecy as not simply giving out information. They understood it as being persuasive intent that God was possibly trying to cause a change in them, which if they responded in repentance, God would then not bring about the destructive prophecy that was predicted. And what happens? <clears throat> God saw their deeds that they turned from their evil ways and God relented or changed his mind concerning the evil or the calamity 
that he, would, he had spoken to do against them. And he did not do it. <coughs> the original prediction did not come true. Um, again, it clearly illustrates that the function, the reason that prophecy was given by Jonah was not simply to give out the information. It was to speak for God's intent for the future to which the people could respond. They could have said, that's all right, we're going to live the way we did and the destruction would have come. <coughs> but in this case, they responded appropriately and repented, turned to God, and it didn't happen. We're going to come back to that issue in the book of Jeremiah. What do we do with predictions that don't come true? Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jonah's a clear case. His prophecy didn't come true, <clears throat> which raises the issue, was Jonah a false prophet because it didn't come true? Um, no, because <clears throat> the intent of prophecy is to persuade. God hopes for a response in light of what God intends to do in the future. And so as we interpret prophecy, uh, any kind of prophecy, we need to ask what kind of response is the prophecy trying to elicit in the audience? And that becomes the point where we can transfer it into our contemporary setting um, because we can use those, <clears throat> we can use the book of Jonah to preach. Again, even though we're not Nineveh, we're not living back in the 700s BC, but if we understand it theologically, what was the point like of Jonah? It's that if, God, if people sin, God will bring judgment upon them. But the intent for that impending judgment is for the people to turn back to God. That has contemporary application um, to us. Okay. So, two things as we, as we read prophecy. One is we are to read it theologically. Looking at the prophecy of saying, you know, what does it tell us about who God is and how God is working? And so the contemporary application, how does the way in which God worked back then inform us of how God is working today? And we are to discern the persuasive intent. What was it trying to get the audience, what kind of audience response? And again, we can then apply it contemporarily of how can the theological message be applied to us today so as to produce a similar response. Again, some of that's easy. If they're using, you know, Jeremiah is a call to repentance we can take his call to repent of the people back then and apply it into our contemporary situation um, and use it as a call for us to repent and to turn back to God. Okay. Is everybody kind of with me yet at this point? Okay. Um, so we've kind of defined prophecy but the other issue, what was an Old Testament prophet? Uh, we'll see that Old Testament prophets functioned in two, two ways. Um, that they are intermediaries between God and the people. And in that role of being an intermediary, they had two primary functions. Um, but there are the Old Testament terms for prophet, and there are several, several ways in which prophets are referred to in the Old Testament. Uh, one is sometimes they're called a seer, which probably refers to the fact that they see visions. 
So they're a seer in the sense that God has given a vision and they see that vision which God has given to them, uh, the vision being the prophetic word. Uh, in fact, in Jeremiah, as we read in chapter 1, his vision, God gives him a vision and God says to him, what do you see? And he says, I see, in this case, an almond branch. So, in other words, visions are, very, are not just receiving a verbal word, they are actually seeing the event. And so, one of the terms in the Old Testament uh, for prophets are, how did they get that message from God? They are a seer. Another one is very similar to that. Sometimes they are referred to as visionaries. Okay, again, meaning they received a vision from God, which then in their role as prophet, they communicated to the people. So a couple of them refer to the reception. How did they get the message from God? An older term, which is used like for Elijah and Elisha, they are referred to as a man of God. Um, and I, we assume that if it was a female prophetess, she would be called a woman of God, okay? Uh, it's just that it's not, there are no references to use of that with respect to female, although there are female prophets, okay? Uh, Huldah, etc. Um, but that really deals with their uh, relationship with God and the accompanying social status which they had. So somebody's called a man of God, they are a prophet, but that means that they have this special relationship as a prophet to God, as well as it is then gives them that social status of being a prophet. Um, it's like calling a person reverent Okay, uh, the title is to designate kind of their relationship with God as well as designates kind of a social hierarchy of standing, or at least it used to. Um, not sure how, you know, pastors are one of the, one of those categories where they now have less and less social standing in the eyes of people. At one point, they had authority in the community, etc. Now it's, yeah, they're kind of more at the bottom of the rung. But anyway, that's a side note. But that's, that's the same type of title or application uh, here for man of God. The main term which is used for later prophets and the major prophets in that is the term prophet. Um, the Hebrew term navi. That is what um, Jeremiah is constantly referred to. Um, not only that, you have, throwing into this, you have not only true prophets, but false prophets. Um, prophets who are proclaiming fake news, <laughs> okay? Um, and we'll get to that issue in the book of Jeremiah because he has to deal with those kind of prophets as well. But the term is used of them as well. Uh, the term Navi, uh, Hebrew derivation of the term, um, if it's in a passive sense, it means one who has been called. And in the active sense of the term, it means one who speaks. Okay, And so the term Navi really indicates more kind of the messenger role of the prophet, uh, because that's the primary function that they are in this intermediary position, they primarily function as messengers. In other words, God gives to the prophet the divine word, which the prophet then as a messenger communicates to the people, okay? Functioning as messengers. A frequent, the messenger phrase in the Old Testament, that's how it's referred to, this phrase we keep running across, thus says Yahweh, or thus says the Lord. Uh, it's actually referred to as the messenger formula because that kind of formula, thus says so-and-so, isn't only found in prophets, it's found in a whole bunch of non-prophetic contexts of that is how a messenger 
would begin their message that they are transmitting from someone else to another party, okay? In other words, uh, it's used in personal message, but oftentimes in official royal messages, as a messenger comes out, they will say, thus says the king, and give the divine decree or official ruling which the king has said. Um, and the function of the messenger formula is so that the people understand the person giving it is not the originator of the message. The message is coming from somebody else. If it's thus says the king, okay, we know this is the king's message. This is not just this, this herald saying this or messengers saying it. This is, this is the king's word and they simply function as the voice to communicate that message. Um, and so uh, for the prophets, when they stand there and say, thus says Yahweh, when the people hear that, they understand that the prophet, the human prophet is not the source of the message. Human prophet is only the messenger who is communicating this message. And the fact that they say, thus says Yahweh, also means they have to recognize that the prophet does have the authority to communicate this, the authority because they have been sent by the one giving the message. So, Prophets like Jeremiah function in this intermediary role as messengers, and that's, that's the primary way in which they are uh, per, portrayed in Scripture. And so Jeremiah, uh, most of the book of Jeremiah is Jeremiah's words from God to the people. If it's all right, uh, thank you, Calvin. Would this be a good time for a break? Uh, it's 11, so translators yes. probably need it. Yeah. All right. I was just going to do two more, make two more comments. Okay, but please, anyway. please go ahead. Yeah, let me just finish this up. Um, this role is intercessor. Oh, the third, along with this, the third category are, are those prophets who kind of stand outside of the political or institutional systems. Jeremiah is clearly that latter category. He's not tied to the royal court, even though he has direct context with them and critiques them. Uh, but then he's also hated by some of the kings who try to put him to death. He stands outside of the institutions uh, speaking to them, okay? Uh, but just let me finish this, it'll take about two minutes. They do function not only as messengers who get the message, give it to the people, they also are to function as intercessors to communicate the people's request to God. Um, this intercessory role is spoken of in Jeremiah chapter 43. This is after the destruction of Jerusalem. The captains, the people come to Jeremiah and say, please let our supplication be presented before you and pray for us to Yahweh your God, that Yahweh your God may show us the way in which we should walk and the things which we should do. And they're, they're asking the question, should we remain here in Jerusalem after the fall or should we go down to Egypt? Okay. But clearly it's, he's functioning in the stance that people come to him, ask the question, he says, okay, I will take it to God and get a response. It's also mentioned in chapter 7, 16, where Jeremiah is told not to act as an intercessor between the people and God. God's fed up with the people, you know, and kind of says, Jeremiah, your normal function would be come and kind of stand in the gap between, you know, me, God, and the people. The, Jeremiah, don't do that anymore. Um, but, yeah. But those two functions or those two roles, intercessor and 
primarily they're presented as messengers, but they clearly did seem to have an intercessory role as well. Okay, so that's kind of what an Old Testament prophet is. And now we will take our break. Yeah, let's take like a 15 minute break here. Any technical difficulties we have will get solved. So, okay. Um, so at 20 after, we will resume. Mm-hmm.